because he has held a couple of uh, very high profile posts and Sue has always been there as an able support and uh, um, uh, kind of a, an ideas person coming up with and uh, it's great that she's here and she's agreed to speak to everybody this afternoon. So uh, she's speaking on the faithfulness of God. So I think um, without anything else without any further ado i will pray an introduction and hand over to you so if that's okay thank you paul yes it is fine so heavenly <laughs> father thank you for this opportunity to uh, to hear what sue has got to say in these days thank you lord for bringing uh, this group of people together using this uh, technology that perhaps even three months ago most of us were not even aware of uh, and yet has become so much part of our everyday life now we thank you for uh, the, the almost the miracle of this technology that allows us to to gather together in this way please we pray your blessing upon uh, everything that happens this afternoon we pray for sue as she um as she she shares uh, pray father that uh, there'll be a, a good healthy time of, of of questions and answers afterwards in jesus name b'shem yeshua amen amen, amen. <clears throat> thank you paul thank Over you, to you paul. thank you now I'm going to just put that on. Oh no, now I've got you, which is rather nice, I have to say. Uh, now I've got nobody. Hang a minute. Um, I wish I hadn't done that now. Hang on a second, everybody, I'll blow it. Um, try that. Sweetheart, I've got a big picture of I know you can all hear this. I've got a big picture of Paul and Jane on the screen. <laughs> you, do you know, I'm good. So everybody listen. My first comment is that I'm bitterly disappointed that although you can see me, I can't see you. I got it in my head. I was going to see all these lovely people on screen. Now I've only got two of them. Mind you, they are particularly lovely. But in any case, I'm really disappointed. But I've got all your names here. And it's just so lovely that you've joined us this afternoon. And uh, I thank you very much for coming. And I pray that something at least of what I say this afternoon will be a blessing to you. So I'm going to talk for a while this afternoon about the faithfulness of God. In our church, we've been doing a series of Bible studies about the attributes of God. Um, Robin, you may remember a few weeks ago, did one on the sovereignty of God. And um, I decided I would do the faithfulness of God. And when I started to look at it, I became completely overwhelmed, really, by what I found. As you can imagine, the scriptures I decided I would note were Psalm 119, Psalm 100, Numbers 23, Psalm 36, Hebrews 6.13, Psalm 92, Lamentations 3, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 119 again, and on and on and on. The scripture is saturated with information about the faithfulness of our God. And I wanted to start with a scripture. So actually finding the scripture I wanted to start with was quite a job. But I eventually decided that I would settle on Psalm 89 and the first eight verses. So here they are. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever with my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise the wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. So there we are, have a, a scripture which 
speaks loud and clear about the all-pervasive, endless faithfulness of God. I think the first thing I really want to say this afternoon is that when you're looking at the attributes of God, I found it impossible, really, to separate off one particular one. It seemed to me as though all the attributes of God are entirely related, interrelated. And, and although they are all somehow separate, they come together as we ponder the whole nature of God. God's sovereignty, his righteousness, his justice, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his love, his immutability, his omnipotence, his eternal nature, his holiness, and on and on and on. But for me, faithfulness and veracity were what I needed to look at, and I'll explain as I go along why those two things and how those two things go together. Everything about God, you see, is all of these things at the same time. And at no time is he ever false to any of these attributes. They are inextricably woven into his nature. And I'm so aware, you know, when I'm trying to share some things like this, <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to talk to you about things that are beyond my understanding and frankly are beyond yours because God is so much greater than our understanding. But, here's the big but, we have the scriptures. And the scriptures speak over and over again about the name of God and the nature of God. In fact, God himself speaks about his name and then demonstrates his nature from Genesis right through to Revelation. It's not really possible, I don't think, to consider the faithfulness of God without aligning it to his veracity. You see, he's faithful to his word and his word is true. When Moses in Exodus 3 asks God his name, you know, God replies, Yahweh, I am, or I am who I am. And Jesus uses the name of God Every time he repeats the I am statements, doesn't he? I am the truth, amongst other things. I am the truth. We, we see, don't we, in all of those I am statements, statements of the divinity of Jesus. And just as an aside, do you notice how interesting it is? If somebody asks you your name, you say, I'm Sue, I'm Paul, I'm Janie, I'm Robin. We always put the name of God first. I am Sue. So, and that's the way it should be. Anyway, that was an aside. Returning to my brief, the very fact that we can transpose the word faithful for the word true explains why the two have to go together. God is faithful to his word because he is true to his word. I mean, Consider when God has ever promised something and not brought it into being. If we ask that question of Noah, of Abraham, Sarah, of Hagar, of Joseph, or Daniel, or Gideon, or David, or Esther, or Samson, or Solomon, or Naomi, Ruth, Jonah, Simeon, Elizabeth, Mary, Moses, Peter, Paul, and on and on and on. They would all say the same thing. They'd say, never. If God promises it, they'd say, it happens. And you know, we could ask the same question of Nebuchadnezzar, of Achan, of Michal, the sons of Eli, Pharaoh, Sennacherib, Herod. And they would give the very same answer, never, because for good and for ill, God keeps his promises and he keeps his word because veracity and faithfulness are embedded in his nature and his name. Interesting, when I'm preparing anything to share, I always ask myself two questions. One is, why am I doing this? And the second one is, what do I want people to feel as a, re as a result? And when I asked myself about this little study, I came up with these answers. I'm doing this 
to affirm and reaffirm for you and for me the absolute faithfulness of God according to scripture and precedent. And secondly, I want those who accompany me on this little journey to feel increasingly more secure in the hands of God and of our Saviour Jesus Christ. And I want us to rejoice more fully in him. Those are my reasons. I hope that they're fulfilled at the end of this session. Well, to begin with, I want to look at the meaning of the word faith. You know that Hebrew is structured completely differently to English and in fact to many other languages. And you also know that it's not a language that's just for academics. Um, knowing a little Hebrew or even knowing about Hebrew is actually, I think, essential for all Christians. You will, many of you know, some may not, that English has around 800,000 words in it and Hebrew has only 60,000 words. And of those 60,000, only 30,000 were in use at the time of the Bible. So you see, with only 30,000 in common usage, it means that every Hebrew word in the Bible, there are approximately 15 ways that you could translate it, which means that we are always in the hands of translators. Each Hebrew word has root letters, as you know, and that's giving the richness to the meaning of any translated word, and it makes connections. But of course, it means that we're at the mercy of translators, when we read any version of the Bible. So you see, that's why we need to know a little about Hebrew and certainly need to know Hebraisms. I mean, if somebody came here and we told, they didn't know anything about the way the English language works and we told them to pull their socks up, that's probably what they do, which, you know, is understandable if you don't understand the way English works and colloquialisms. And the same thing is true in the scripture. If you don't know, that to have a good eye is to be generous and you don't notice that that scripture comes in a whole range of scriptures about generosity then you will probably sit through an awful lot of sermons about eyes bringing light into the body and stuff like that and it's not about that it's about generosity and it's a colloquialism a hebraism for generosity now the word faithfulness in hebrew is from the root word emunah which speaks of belief but much more it speaks of firm persuasion of assurance of conviction that which is perfect and accurate true and unwavering reliable loyal authentic and real and more faithfulness and truth are both legitimate translations of the same hebrew word emunah it can be translated either way but there's even more to emunah than that because Emunah shares the same root as the word Amen, which is much more than an agreement in prayer. Emunah is an innate conviction. It's a perception of truth that transcends reason. Amen is better translated, yes, that's the way it's going to be. In fact, you know, when I ran a school with kids in it, I used to tell them that's what Amen went, meant. That's the way it's going to be. It's an unwavering affirmation of and in agreement for any expressed prayer. It could be translated, yes, it is firmly and truly so. In Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, we read, The righteous shall live by emunah, that is firmness, steadiness and solid belief. It's also interesting to note that the Hebrew word meaning to live and to breathe, which can be translated life, can also be translated as I am, and I was, and I will be. In other words, that word can also be translated to mean a perfect reality. And of course, this is the name God gave himself. So if you and I were to elaborate on God's name, it might sound like this. I am the assured, unwavering, reliable, loyal, 
authentic, transcendent, permanent, certain, loving, true, and faithful reality. Well, that's quite a mouthful. So God decided to make it I am instead. Now, as you know, names are very important in the Bible. Adam meaning man and Abraham, father of many, Jesus, deliverer and rescuer and so on. And names always indicate something important about the person's nature. The name has to fit the person, represent the person, be in tune with the person's nature. This is important because God's name and his nature are one. God has complete integrity so that his actions will always be in perfect agreement with his nature and true to his name. He is faithful because he is faithfulness. He is true because he is truth. Now with these things in mind, I want to look at just a few scriptures which show God's faithfulness and there are many. I looked at Hebrews 6, 13 to 18 and read this. Well, we're considering here the promises to Abraham, promises to which God has remained faithful across thousands of years to this day. The writer to the Hebrews states this. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it, and without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath, so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. God is bound by his nature to keep his promise. He is bound by an oath which he made in his own name. And as God cannot lie and his word is true and his nature is entirely faithful to his promises, therefore his covenants are fixed and sure. Consider how in Genesis 15, God cuts the covenant with Abraham. He asks for the animals to be brought, the heifer, the goat, the ram, and they're cut in two and arranged either side opposite each other according to the custom. Then a dove is brought um, and a young pigeon. They're not cut, but they are brought also as part of the covenant sacrifice. Normally, two parties walk between the pieces of the animals, between them as the covenant is cut. But not on this occasion. You remember, Abraham is put into a deep sleep. And when the sun had set a smoking fire pot, and a blazing torch move between the pieces of the animals. Because on that day, God cuts the covenant on his own with himself. And to break it, God would have to deny his name and his nature. He would have lied. It is this covenant which gives Abraham's descendants the land of Canaan. This unconditional covenant that God made with himself in Genesis 15 relates to the land which God was giving to Abraham's descendants. And you and I know that was a great deal more land than they occupy today. Moving on, let's listen to what God says of himself in Numbers 23:19. Here Balaam is speaking God's words to Balak, the Moabite king. He says, God is not a man that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? It's a rhetorical question. God does not lie because he cannot. What he says, he does, period. He's entirely trustworthy, trustworthy 
and unwaveringly faithful to his word. Balaam is speaking the word the Lord had given him, and through it, God is announcing his otherness. Male and female, God is beyond our understanding. We cannot fathom the depths of God nor the height of God. But we are reminded in scripture continually of his nature. In Isaiah and chapter 46 and verse 10, God says to his people Israel, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You know, I can, whenever I read that scripture, I can hear Lance Lambert saying it. Yes, God tells us that he will make things known to us that have not yet taken place. So we have a yardstick against which to measure God's faithfulness. I was checking out biblical prophecies and I came upon this writing relating to that Isaiah scripture, the one I've just quoted. It says this, supernatural predictions are evidence provided to us for verification. Not a single prophecy from the Bible has been proven false. Many prophecies remain in the future, but all have come to pass and have been verified to be true so far. Thousands of prophecies from the Bible have already been fulfilled. Revelation 1.7 tells us, look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. And we know that was written in about AD 70. And at the time, it was impossible to understand how every eye could see anything. And yet now we're proving this afternoon that technology can enable all manner of things to happen, including many thousands, millions upon millions of people seeing on their screens something happen at the very same time. And thus I say, God is faithful across the centuries to his word against all odds. And against the understanding of those to whom he prophesies, because his word is truth. I was struck recently by this. I came across this example um, of God's faithfulness and of his, his precision. Listen, um, in 332 BC, Alexander the Great con conquered the island fortress of Tyre by building a causeway from the ruins of the old city. And this fulfilled the prophecy in Ezekiel 26, 4 to 5, which I confess I'd hitherto not really noticed. Because he built, a, sorry, which was written, the prophecy in Ezekiel, I'm sorry everybody, uh, the prophecy in Ezekiel was written hundreds of years before the, the time of Alexander the Great. At the time of Ezekiel, Tyre was the capital city of Phoenicia and the island fortress of Tyre. And that hadn't really been built properly. But Ezekiel predicted, nevertheless, they shall destroy the walls of Tyre, break down her towers, and I will also scrape the dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. That's what it says in Ezekiel. 200 years after that, it is recorded that Alexander scraped away everything, scraped away is the word that's used, of the old city, leaving nothing but the bare rock surrounded by sea. I mean, what incredible detail that is. Isn't that astonishing? That a scripture, a small scripture, hidden away almost in Ezekiel, or certainly hidden from me, I've never noted it before, has been fulfilled absolutely to the letter. And there are thousands of prophecies spoken by the Lord and faithfully fulfilled in the smallest detail in the Hebrew scriptures. 
and there are hundreds of fulfilled prophecies relating to the birth and life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus himself in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 says, I tell you the truth, this generation shall not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And we note that the word translated generation should really have been translated race because it refers to the Jewish people. And in this scripture, we hear Jesus speaking as God. He's acknowledging he is God by making this statement and affirming the complete reliability and faithfulness of his word. Jeremiah 31, 31 and following says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was an husband to them, says the Lord. But this is my covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. And in the 20th century, no, the 21st century, God's proved his faithfulness, hasn't he, by returning the people of Israel to their ancient homeland, as he promised to Abraham thousands of years before. It's amazing to me when I look at that scripture that we can almost, I think I heard somebody say this once, every time you open the curtains in the morning and see the sun shining, you know Israel's safe. Because until the natural order ceases, God has promised Israel will be in the land he's promised them. Look again with me in Deuteronomy in chapter 7 and verses 9 to 10. Because here you've got an explicit um, record of God's total faithfulness to his covenant as he speaks to his people Israel through Moses after giving the Ten Commandments. Therefore, says the word, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And then the next bit that some people don't bother to read. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. We cannot avoid the second part of that promise, you know, though no one ever wants to focus on it. But it does say God will repay those who hate him. And we're faced there, aren't we, with God's justice. We can't avoid the fact that God's faithfulness sometimes is worked out through judgment. And yes, and punishment to those who hate him and live lives completely opposed to his ordinances, completely opposed to his will. Everything we do as individuals, as a nation, is set against the yardstick of his word. And when our actions, our behaviour, our laws and our society is set against God's expressed will, there will be consequences. And this scripture comes immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments. And God's use of the term thousands, I understand to mean innumerable, like cattle on a thousand hills in Psalm 50. 
In the New Testament, in 2 Timothy 2.13, we read this ultimate truth about God's faithfulness. It says this, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. It is not enough to say that God has integrity. God is I am, therefore he is complete integrity. He is who he says he is. He does what he says he will do. He honours and keeps his covenant promises. He cannot lie. Accounts of God's covenants can be found more than 270 times in the Bible. But God is also entirely faithful to his promises as well as his covenants. And I understand someone's done a, uh, a calculation. There are over 3,000 promises made by God in the scripture. Some, of course, are conditional, but others, others are totally unconditional. In the scripture I've just read about uh, us being faithless, Paul underlines for Timothy that whatever we do, God remains faithful. And he says, why? Because he can't deny himself. The fact of God's complete and total reliability is what gives the world its order. I've got a kind of personal belief about this, that the order in the universe itself would be compromised if God was not reliable, if God was not trustworthy. God's faithfulness and order. It's established that day should follow night, that spring should follow winter, that the sea should encroach on the land only so far, that an embryo should develop into a fully formed human being, that a wound should knit together and heal over. All these things and many more demonstrate God's order, which demonstrates his faithfulness. It makes our God the secure rock on which we stand. God's covenants and promises are set into the fabric of life and the created world. Covenant abides in the depths of God. Covenant is immutable, irreversible and incontrovertible. So what then are the objects of God's faithfulness? Well, there are three main ones. His name, which... I have spoken about his word which I have spoken about and then his people the Jews and believing born-again Christians we read in Ezekiel as God speaks over the mountains of Israel which we know is the West Bank he's telling his people Israel that he will bring them back to their own land and he's making it plain why he's doing it this is a scripture that I've had on my heart for years now they have, after all, been a disobedient and stiff-necked people. Which probably means we've got a few things in common with them, come to think of it. But Ezekiel 36 says this, Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things but for the sake of my holy name, which you've profaned among the nations where you've gone, I will show myself holy and show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I'm proved holy through you before their eyes. God has to do this. Because he said he will, and his name is at stake. That's why the issue of Israel and the salvation of Israel is of such vital significance. That's why Satan will do any and everything in his power to destroy the, the land of Israel and vilify the Jewish people. We know that. God's name is at stake over their survival. And according to Jesus himself, the Messiah isn't going to return to earth until the Jews cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, every time a Jew receives salvation in the name of Yeshua, the world takes another step closer to Jesus coming back. That's how incredibly vital the work of CMJ is. That's how pivotally important the work of CMJ is. You must have heard the story, if you have, tough, because I'm going to tell it again, of the Russian Tsar, 
who on his deathbed he'd got no faith was asked one as one of his trusted advisors how can i be certain that god exists and the advisor said the jews your majesty the jews the jews and the land of israel are proving god exists that's what they're doing they're proving the faithfulness and veracity of god they don't all realize it but they are and they will soon god's true to his nature he's still keeping his word to abraham it's amazing and i have earnestly urged people in our own church and i'm sure you'll do the same not to see the issue of the jews and israel as some peripheral issue you know something some people are really into and you know well theirs is they they do stuff about israel and the jews you know i say to them no it's fundamentally important it's totally significant the future of the church of god depends on her attitude to israel remember i bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and I'll go on saying that in the church till they carry me out feet first. Because it's the truth. I mean, look, the Roman Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Turkish Empire, the Nazis, or many more, all dealt wickedly with God's chosen people. And they're consigned to the rubbish heap of history. Who knows what this country might have escaped? if we dealed honorably with the Jewish people during the years of the mandate, who knows? As it is, we now live in a post-Christian society which exalts personal license and calls it freedom, which sets other gods aside the one true living God. Though, how far have we fallen when babies are killed in the womb, when creation's destroyed, when the, the so-called gender issue and gender politics destroys the image of God, compromises the Lord. And the notion that the church is the bride of Christ is, is, is completely confused by political correctness. It gets me a bit riled up, you've perhaps noticed. Moving on, I'm always interested that God always personalizes and qualifies his name. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the point of that. He's a personal God relating to us individually. He always goes on, who brought them out of the land of Egypt? In other words, he says, I'm a personal God who does things. And only a God who's a true living reality can do that. In fact, that's how he demonstrates his faithfulness. He cuts his covenants and makes his promises and keeps them. In Exodus 20, in which of the Ten Commandments, it begins, it begins, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. It's reminding the people of God's faithfulness in the Exodus. And just as surely as every day we live, we can know that God is the one who through the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus brought each of us up out of the land of sin and death to his marvellous light. And why? Because he's consistently faithful to his word. Joel 2, Acts 2, Romans 10, all state categorically that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the promise that God, who, of the God who watches over his word to perform it. And he does what he says, and I say hallelujah. I decided I'd just look very quickly <clears throat> at a couple of people from scripture. If you look at the story of Joseph, consider, consider for a moment with me what happened to him. I mean, he's rejected by his own people, by his brothers, by his family. He was taken over by the Gentiles, a real picture here of Yeshua. He was dressed in unfamiliar garb, then placed in charge of the resources that were to bring life to um, the perishing nation of Israel. Joseph, by doing all that, foreshadows Jesus in so many ways. But I'm very moved at the end of Joseph's story because it's then that Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. 
He's overwhelmed with emotion and he asks everyone to leave him. And then he weeps as he tells his brothers who he is. What a picture that gives us everybody of a day yet to come when Yeshua will make himself known to the Jewish people, his brothers and sisters in the flesh. Will he weep? Oh yes, I think so. What a reunion that will be. The point I'm making here though is that God remains totally faithful to Joseph throughout all of that long story, bringing about his redemptive purposes. So we see that personal attack, imprisonment, lo loss of reputation, loss of family, the passing of time cannot stop the outworking of God's faithfulness. If you look at the book of Ruth and God's faithfulness to Naomi, a woman who loses her husband, who leaves her family, loses her husband, loses her sons, finds herself in a far country, suffers hunger, says, call me Mara, bitter. But who, through the faithfulness of her Gentile daughter, Ruth, eventually holds in her arms the baby Obed, who was to be the grandfather of King David and in the line of the Messiah. So what do we see? Personal disaster, loss of life, separation from home, country of birth, hunger and hardship cannot stop the outworking of God's faithfulness. God uses any and all circumstances to weave together the reality of his promises. And Isaiah 66, you know this one. Can a nation be born in a day or in a moment? You could, you could translate in a moment. God's prophetic word was fulfilled. We know in May 1948 when the state of Israel was resurrected from the ashes of the Holocaust. So what do we see there? That the very worst that man can do to man cannot stop the outworking of God's faithfulness. And then the most astonishing of all is Yeshua, our saviour. And it's easy to check on the internet the dozens of prophecies there are about the Messiah, all faithfully fulfilled in his life, death and resurrection. Over and over, God proves his faithfulness to his word and to the word made flesh. Until at the end, we see God's ultimate act of redemption in the resurrection of Jesus. If you reread Psalm 22, and you can marvel at the prophetic provision of that word made a reality at the death of Jesus on the cross. It's quite astonishing, the description of crucifixion before it was even ever thought of. And you can see the promise in verse 27, that all the ends of the earth will remember, and so they do today, and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord. And he rules the nations. Just take a drink of water. I'm nearly finished, folks. I hope you're still with me. As surely as these former prophecies are fulfilled at the cross, so shall this verse be fulfilled because of God's proven faithfulness. You know, we sing, great is thy faithfulness and faithful God so unchanging and faithful you are, faithful, faithful forever you will be. And all God's promises are yes and amen in your sure. I actually Googled songs about God's faithfulness and I found 3,638, so I thought I wouldn't bother with those. But there are countless scriptures about the faithfulness of God. But four from Revelation struck me, and I want to come toward the end as I share them with you. In the book of Revelation and chapter 9, verse 11, we see a picture of Jesus, and it says this. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. There are three further references in the book of Revelation. Chapter 3, 14, chapter 21, verse 5, and chapter 22, verse 6, where Jesus and his word are referred to as faithful and true. We can trust our faithful and true God for all that is to come 
And the proof we have is all that God has done in the past in line with his covenants and promises. I believe that, I don't understand it fully, but I believe that issues surrounding COVID-19 somehow, just the beginning of something, the beginning of birth pangs, because we know for sure God will continue to be true to his word. And as time passes, with things like COVID-19 and whatever is to follow, you know, people are going to be more and more eager to know scripture and to know the God who's bound by his own name to keep his word and to save them. Just like in the story of Genesis and 5020, sorry, in the story of Joseph, Genesis 5020, we'll be able to hold fast to the scripture that says what the enemy planned for evil against us, God planned for good to bring about the survival of many. And finally, listen to what God says to you and me. In Hebrews 13, he says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. In Philippians 1, it says, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Philippians 1, he's be he who's begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And then Psalm 103, as for the heavens as high above, uh, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy to Toward those who fear him, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed his transgressions from us. Matthew 26, 64. I say to you, Jesus is speaking, hereafter you will see, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And one day usher in this world that we cannot wait to see where the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. These things, it says in Revelation, are faithful and true. And the Lord of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly be done. And then finally, and this is a final final, in Revelation, God's dwelling place is now among his people and he'll dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order, things has passed away. The scriptures are overflowing with it. The covenant promises to you and I, and we can trust them because over the centuries, the Lord has proved himself faithful and true to his word to the prophets, to the great company of characters in the Hebrew scriptures, to the disciples, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and to you and I over the space of our lives to date. Why would we doubt? Our Bibles end in the final words of Jesus. Yes, emunah, I'm coming soon. Amen, say I. Come, Lord Jesus. God bless you all. Thank you for sticking with me. Your stars. Hello. Anybody out there? <laughs> I hope everybody can hear me. That was brilliant, Sue. That was very enlightening, very encouraging, quite inspiring. So thank you so much for that. You've obviously got a lot of work into that.